Good evening, everybody. So, after hearing those two exciting talks, I'll be talking a bit about recurrent rectal detachments because this is one beast we really need to tame. And uh, good visualization with digital microscopy really helps us do that. So, I'll just start with some of the merits and demerits. I think uh, Dr. Natarajan has really described a lot of these already, and so has Aditya, but just a few points which I thought were important about the digital uh, microscope. And then I'll talk about recurrent RD, which are most challenging cases, hence the visualization part is even more critical for the success of these cases. So like we discussed, Artebo 800, is it a new era or is it a new toy in our armamentarium? And it has definite advantages. It has more surgeon comfort, as Dr. Natarajan showed, higher magnification, good depth of focus despite the magnification, and excellent resolution with high magnification, especially at the posterior pole. A big advantage of the post pay for the patients is there's low light exposure, so less chance of light toxicity. And you can change the color value of the light which you use while operating. So for example, blue colors for high myopes or albinotic fungus, funduses, green for the vascular prolifs, and yellow which has less reflections under air. A great advantage of this current system is you can, uh, there's an ability to switch from the screen to the microscope view. So it, you don't need to really do a lot of maneuvers for that because uh, of the design of this microscope. So you can switch and do it as per the surgeon's preference. And there's the lag is so, it's really earlier, always the problem used to be the lag, but with this system, the lag is almost imperceptible for us. Uh, everything has its disadvantages. So of course, there are some OR logistics. For example, the cataract surgeons sitting temporarily would need to change the screen position depending on the right or the left eye of the patient being operated. For the assistants, they need to turn their neck. So all this needs more space in the OR. Placement of the vitrectomy machine, anesthesia machine, etc. because you don't want anything coming in the way, in the sight of the screen. And you need to have that particular distance where you keep the screen. Some of the other challenges we faced a bit were the reflections or intraocular structures and instruments. And sometimes the peripheral working poses a challenge. So sometimes we need to vary the illumination quite a bit more. And this depends on the intensity used. So this is a just a nutshell about this system. And let's move on to our topic for today, which is recurrent RD which is basically redetachment of the retina after successful primary attachment. And although the failure rates have decreased due to advances in surgical techniques and ad advancements in visualization, it is a reality which every VR surgeon has to face from time to time. This can occur after a pneumatic retinopexy, after buckling or after vitrectomy. Causes would be the ineffective closure of the break at the time of the surgery, missed breaks, new breaks occurring intra postoperatively, development of a macular hole or because of PVR. How do we manage this? You can either inject a gas and do a pneumoretinopexy. You can revise or add a scleral buckle. You can do a vitrectomy or you can do membrane peeling under oil. I'll be showing surgical videos of all these steps. So recurrent RD after buckle, additional of a buckle element, I think Aditya said buckle has become very rare, but I think we are still a little old fashioned. We still do it quite often. And this was a fake patient, uh, 47 year old. We didn't, this patient after buckling, you can see the buckle effect, but still had some nasal fluid. So we didn't want to really go a vitrectomy or touch the lens. So you can see we did something which we, which is very rarely done now. We did a revision buckle where a new buckle element has been added and this is the nasal quadrant. So this is just about and the medial rectus. And this is where the buccal element was missed. And there was a missed break, which was located superior nasally. So this could be covered. And you can see the post-op optos picture with a well-attached retina below. And patient had a restoration of vision. If we talk about vitrectomy being done again, let's, it must be done in a stepwise manner. So if the, for the anterior segment, if there's a cataract, please do a phaco or a lensectomy. If the IOL is unstable, remove the lens. At the start, you decide the gauge and putting a buckling element is quite important in most of these cases. Why? Because buckling relieves the circumferential and AP traction. It isolates the peripheral retina from posterior, forming a new aura serrata. 
and we normally use 240 buckle or 276 tire if they're large inferior brakes. Spend time on membrane dissection because anterior PVR is more common in these vitrectomized eyes because there's a large skirt of uncut vitreous in the periphery. Go back, tackle the posterior PVR, tackle the membranes and subretinal oils, then do the ILM peeling if required and the role of retinectomy and tamponade is also going to be discussed. So if you can see my first video, this was a case where we did bimanual surgery for posterior PVR. This was a case, first we removed the oil and you can see there was some anterior capsular phimosis, which was preventing view of the retina. So as we always said, visualization is the key, is very important in these cases. So we did that, we opened the thing and now the chandelier is put, the chandelier really helps with visual. You can just see how much better the view is now and how we can proceed with bimanual surgery with the placement of the chandelier. And if we look carefully, if we find the cause of, of this traction is this napkin ring-like membrane, which is subretinal. So bimanually we pull, and although there's a retinotomy, this membrane is quite adherent and with both hands, we pull it out. And this is a hand upon hand maneuver, which I'll show you later again. And this is how we can remove the membrane in total. And this is the only way we could re release or the entire traction, which was causing this kind of a stiff retina and the retina is uh, opposed and we do laser to this. So a few tips and tricks. So for tackling subretinal bands, this is the hand upon hand. We derived manager. inspiration for vitro-retinal surgery from the hand upon hand manner in which a bucket of water is pulled out of a well. We depict a bimanual technique for tackling subretinal bands in recurrent RD based on the same principle. In this 24 year old boy with recurrent RD, we carefully choose the point of the retinotomy at the site of confluence of the subretinal bands and marked it with endodiathermy. We then entered the subretinal space with end gripping forceps and bimanually removed the bands atraumatically using hand upon hand technique. We did. So this is another case, which was like a quotes case with Dr. Aditya had also shown, but uh, this was a patient who earlier had a treated retinal detachment in the periphery, but came with an acute on chronic RD. And this is, you can just see, so there's a lot of subretinal exudation, cholesterol crystals, etc. And first, so we find that this is why the retina is not going back. So, so we realize that we may need to remove this. So first, we try to remove the epiretinal traction with the bimanual technique. And now you can see how the subretinal membranes along with the cholesterol crystals are coming out bimanually. And this I think was important because some of this was gravitating posteriorly and would have had an outcome uh, on the visual outcome also. So you can see how extensive it is. It's, we didn't even realize it's, this would be so extensive initially when we started the surgery. And you can see how nicely it is visualized with the system. And this is what allowed us to kind of do it. And even at the time of now, you can see the fluid air exchange taking place, break is settled, but now you, you have a look at the posterior pole. We are there with the flute needle and you can see these crystals migrating and going in. So this also helped remove all this material from the posterior pole. Inferotempor, inferonasally also, there was a separate area which had been earlier treated and this just did not attach initially. So we made a separate small retinotomy and this is what, this was settled and laser was done. Sometimes finding a break is also quite tough in these uh, in certain cases of redetachment. So this was a little uh, interesting video we made for that on how to locate an occult break. This lady had a recurrence two years post silicon oil removal. There was an inferior shallow RD along with previous laser marks, but no obvious break was seen. We tried to locate the break with the help of Schlereen with a brush needle, but we were unsuccessful. We thought out of the box and made a 38 gauge retinotomy and slowly injected subretinal brilliant blue dye. As the dye filled the subretinal space, 
we had a eureka moment we saw the blue dye emerge from a very tiny temporal break near a laser mark once the break was found we removed the dye with a brush needle then performed the fluid air exchange and settled the retina so that was something which was just gave us a clue as to where these small occult breaks can be uh what are other thing which i would like to talk about is circumferential anterior traction and this is something which is a real bugbear in recurrent rd and we had we have described a maneuver called tug of war which was really useful for this so i'd like to just show a small animation and a video on that in these cases i like to perform a maneuver called tug of war based on the shearing force a rope undergoes during the killing We use opposing forceps to tug and shear the membranes gently and relieve the traction without resorting to a retinotomy. See this young, highly myopic girl with circumferential traction bands predisposing to anterior PBR. This maneuver allowed us to bimanually release anterior circumferential traction. We took two forceps at 180 degrees to each other, then pulled and shredded the bands holding up the retina. Once the bands were separated from the underlying retina, they could be safely trimmed by the vitrectomy cutter. As the traction was released, the retina fell back and settled, without requiring any retinotomies. With a sigh of relief, we perform laser to the attached retina. So, in fact, this maneuver gives good results in even severe cases where you can have a closed funnel kind of detachment. And this is a post buckle also. Many often we get such cases. So, so you can again see the two forceps performing the tug of war. So basically. It, prevents us from having to do large retinectomies or re relaxing retinotomies in the periphery by doing this maneuver this was another young girl who we operated and retina attached quite well this is the post op photograph so this is briefly how it is you take the two forceps to break the bands and i'm happy to share this is published in one of the recent issues of uh, indian journal of ophthalmology uh, tug of war bimanual technique for anterior circumferential pvr in recurrent rd so now uh, the pvr can be located anywhere so this is a patient who i wanted to show who had posterior and anterior pvr so like we described in the slides in the beginning first we would like to tackle the posterior pvr and now we are fortunate because we have a lot of instruments in our armamentarium we use the forceps initially to kind of grasp it and make a plane and then the cutter can be used gently and because we are using 25 gauge cutters we can really go close to retina safely and trim these membranes using those so here we can see it was a fake patient so we don't even use a microscope we the anterior pvr we are tackling directly with direct visualization and in a bimanual way with the right hand scissor left hand forceps we are kind of removing the anterior pvr and now with the cutter we can separate it and it goes back and gets attached uh this is another case i'd like to talk to you about i said a, a retinal detachment was there in a, a high myop so this was a patient you can it was a very high myop axial length was 33 mm and there was a failed macula hole so although he was operated and ilm was peeled still the macula hole did not close and then he came to us with a retina detachment and a total vitreous hemorrhage so that time we could not image the patient so we were wondering how to close the hole because closing the hole was essential for settling the detachment also so you just like to have a look at the surgery so we in fact we put us encircling to 40 bell buckle and we removed all the heme and we saw there's a bulbous rd and you can still see some of the heme is there in the periphery and there was a large macula hole so here again we used amniotic membrane i think a beautiful video aditi also showed for this and we decided that we would plug the hole using the amniotic membrane 
This has been described by Professor Rizzo first from Italy, and we have not done too many cases, but we have found it useful in uh, cases which are really, really recalcitrant or situations like that, macular holes in very high myopes with a retina detachment. And here you can see bimanually we're settling the amniotic membrane over the macular hole and uh, PFCL is there in place. Now we do the fluid air exchange and laser all around and you can see the buckle effect also. So this patient, you can see, this was a failed hole and you can see the nicely amniotic membrane plugging the hole and you can make out what a high myope it is. You can see the contour of the sclera in this. And these are the post-op pictures. You can see a nicely attached retina. In the center picture, you can see the membrane and in the lower one, you can see it plugging the hole beautifully. This is another pre-op versus post-op picture. Membrane peeling under oil. So this is another small thing I tip we'd like to say that if you have a recurrent detachment with a focal area of uh, traction, you don't really need to remove all the oil. You can just do a localized membrane peeling under oil and then you, you uh, can settle the retina quite well with this maneuver. Tamponade, I think everyone knows about it, but just a little thing about heavy silicon oil. This has been designed to overcome the disadvantages of silicon oil and gas. They are heavier than water. And because of the high increased density, they go good endotamponade effect to the inferior and posterior pole without having to do the prone positioning. In the normal uh, position also, or sitting up or lying down supine, they give a good tamponade. And the problems with the inferior RD is normally the oil has lower density than water. It floats up and the surface of the lower retina periphery is not tamponaded well which allows a, mix, a mixture of aqueous and growth factors, which we call PVR soup, to kind of accumulate. And this always uh, promotes the development of inferior PVR and a recurrent inferior RD. So that's why the RDs with PVR and open inferior breaks or membranes, or patients who are elderly or children with positioning issues, this is a good option. But the problem is, it's of course, it's not a substitute for an incomplete surgery and uh, the issue of cost and availability is there with this. So I'd like to just conclude with this uh, slide, which I just explained to you. If you have a recurrent RD post vitrectomy and the oil has been removed, so see the slide on the right, then you, need, of course, have to do a re vitrectomy and all these maneuvers, which I just spoke to you about. If the recurrence is in an oil-filled eye, then look, if there's just inferior uh, break and no PVR, maybe you can just add a laser or a buckle at inferiorly if they are focal membranes, you may just get away with a relaxing retinotomy in that area of membrane peeling. However, if there's extensive PVR, subretinal gliosis or subretinal oil, you need to do all the, go all the way with the oil removal, peeling of the membrane, managing the lens with retinotomies, bell buckle, and refilling the silicon oil. These are my acknowledgements. Thank you very much.